Hey, I'm Serenity and this is my channel and welcome back to another Ludicrous Atrocities. Today we're joined by Ginger and Nova. She's back there on a pillow. And today we're going to be talking about the world's biggest plagiarizer, which is not something I thought would actually have a title, but it does. So let's get into it. Ludicrous Atrocities is a series on my channel where I find the most mind-boggling crimes ever committed, but the things these crimes all have in common is that they are mostly non-violent and the funniest crimes I have ever researched. They are much more lighthearted Basically, I know for a lot of people, the true crime genre can be really hard to stomach. Most of the time, you're hearing about the most deranged things happening to unsuspecting victims. This series is for those of you who want to get into the true crime genre, but can't hear about violent crimes. So I've gathered a list of non-violent crimes that are just humorous. Something illegal happened, but for the most part, in most of these stories, no one is harmed. At least not physically, maybe financially they are. It's supposed to be lighthearted, telling you about a crime that hopefully teaches you a little bit of history and you walk away without a heavy true crime case on your mind. So today we're talking about the biggest plagiarizer ever known named Jason Blair. Buckle up, grab a blanket, grab a snack, a drink, and let's begin. We have all had it drilled into us to never copy and paste something we didn't write and claim it as our own. The action is called plagiarism. It's been drilled into me since I was in middle school and then over again in high school, and I'm sure it will follow me through my college years. However, this could have been because I went to a STEM and tech high school while also taking multiple college credits classes. Who knows? However, I am sure that we never could have guessed that there is actually a person who holds the record for being the world's biggest plagiarizer. I know you're thinking it has to be a college student who committed the crime, but you could not be further from the truth. It was a staff reporter at the New York Times named Jason Thomas Blair. Jason Thomas Blair was born on March 23rd, 1976 in Columbia, Maryland. He was the son of a federal executive and a school teacher. During Jason's time attending the University of Maryland in college, College Park, he studied to be a journalist. From the years 1996 to 1997, the academic school year, he was selected as the second African-American editor-in-chief of the school student newspaper titled The Diamondback. According to a 2004 article by the Baltimore Sun, some of Jason's fellow students opposed his selection, describing him as an elbows-out competitor. After a summer interning at the New York Times in 1998, Jason Blair was offered an extended internship at the newspaper. He actually declined the offer in order to complete some coursework for graduation, but returned to the Times in June of 1999 with a year of coursework left to complete on his college degree. In November of 1999, he was classified as an intermediate reporter. He was later promoted to a full reporter and then to an editor. I'm sure that we all don't know much about the journalism world, especially the ins and outs, but by multiple accounts, Jason's rise to the top of the industry was astounding to many people. By the age of 27, he was the lead reporter on the Beltway Sniper shootings and trial, which was one of the biggest news stories at the time. For the most prominent newspaper in the country, he was the head reporter. Altway sniper shootings was a spree in Washington, D.C., the U.S. Capitol, area that killed 10 people and injured three over a three-week period in October 2002. In late April of 2003, a reporter at the San Antonio Express News named Macarena Hernandez, who was also a former colleague of Jason Blair's, noticed similarities between a story Jason had written and one she had published just two days earlier. Macarena notified her editors who in turn contacted the New York Times. Shortly after the paper started investigating Jason Blair when he handed in his resignation on May 1st, 2003. He then checked into a mental health clinic. As the Times began to go through Jason's history without his aid, they discovered dozens instances of plagiarism, fabrication, and deceit. The investigation led to an article by the Times titled Correcting the Record Piece. I'll get back to that article in a second. However, the details continue continued to emerge about Jason Blair's misdeeds long before this article had emerged, including allegations that he had committed many of the same sins at the Baltimore Sun publication, which he had interned at before the times in his college days. He also had many similar allegations levied against him during his tenure as an editor at the Diamondback, the college paper he was part of during his time at the University of Maryland, where he attended for his higher education degree. So back to the correcting the record piece. I was able to find the archived article, which is shocking because in 2003 it was physical newspapers and not the internet. So I did find it. On May 11, 2003, the article was published by five journalists named Dan Barry, David Barstow, Jonathan D. Glader, Adam Lispeck, and Hakez Steinberg. Here's what it said in a nutshell and I quote, a staff reporter for the New York Times committed frequent acts of journalistic fraud while covering significant news events in recent months, an investigation by the Times journalists have found. The widespread fabrication and plagiarism 
racism represents a profound betrayal of trust and a low point in the 152 year history of the newspaper. The authors of the article revealed that the reporter was named Jason Blair, who was 27 years old, who was plagiarizing works from all other news places in Maryland, Texas, and multiple other states while he lived in New York City. Jason would fabricate comments, concoct scenes, and stolen material from other newspapers and wire services, claiming them as his own. Jason also selected certain details from photographs to create the impression that he was somewhere or had seen someone related to the story when he in fact had done none of those things. He also used these lies to write false articles regarding emotional charge moments in current news events. This included the events such as the deadly sniper attacks in Washington that I mentioned earlier to the anguish of families grieving for loved ones killed in Iraq. At the time of this article being published, the Times journalists were able to uncover plagiarism and overall lying problems in at least 36 of the 73 articles at the time that Jason had published at the newspaper since November of 2002. Keep in mind, he left in May of 2003. That included the national reporting assignments he began to be assigned in October of 2002. So just a few months of articles were filled with lies. In the final months Jason worked at the publication, his deceptions grew week by week. In the final months Jason worked at the publication, he was on the path to professional destruction. The Times inquiry also establishes that various editors and reporters express misgivings about Jason Blair's reporting skills, maturity, and behavior during his five-year journey from a raw intern to reporter on national news events. Their warning censored mostly on the errors in his articles. After taking a leave for personal problems and being sternly warned, both orally and in writing, that his job was in peril, Jason Blair improved his performance at the Times. By October of 2002, the newspaper's top two editors, who said they believed that Jason Blair had turned his life and work around, had guided him to the understaffed national desk where he was assigned to help cover the Washington sniper case. By the end of that month, public officials and colleagues were beginning to challenge his reporting. By November 2002, the investigation had found he was fabricating questions and scenes undetected. By March 2003, he was lying in his articles and to his editors about being at a court hearing in Virginia, in a police chief's home in Maryland, and in front of a soldier's home in West Virginia. By the end of 2003, another newspaper was raising questions about plagiarism, and by the 1st of May, his career at the Times was over. A few days later, Jason Blair issued a statement that referred to personal problems and expressed contribution. But during several telephone conversations, he declined repeated requests to help the newspaper correct the record or comment on any aspect of his work. He did not respond to messages left on his cell phone with his family and his union representative. Over 150 interviews by the reporters during their investigation led to several reasons Jason Blair's deceit went undetected for so long, which included a failure of communication am among senior editors, few complaints from the subjects of his articles, his savviness, and his in ingenious ways of covering his track. Most of all, no one saw his carelessness as a sign that he was capable of systemic fraud. At the time, Jason Blair was one of about 375 reporters at the Times. Author Selzenberg Jr., chairman of the New York Times Company and publisher of the newspaper, whose family has owned and a controlling interest at the Times for 107 years, said the following, and I quote, it's a huge black eye, it's an obligation of the trust between the newspaper and its readers. For all the pain resonating through the Times newsroom, the hurt may be more acute in places like Bersteta, Maryland, where one of Jason's fabricated articles described American soldiers injured in combat. The puzzlement is deeper too, in places like Marment, West Virginia, where a woman named Glenda Nelson learned that Jason Blair had quoted her in news articles, even though she had never spoken to anyone at the Times. As he would do in tons of articles, Jason Blair appeared to have stitched his misleading narratives by drawing at least partly on information available in databases of various news organizations. Basically, he was plagiarizing parts of other news articles and passing them off as his own, the definition of plagiarism. The paper concerned about maintaining its integrity amongst readers told its journalists to follow many guidelines as described in a memo on the newsroom's internal website. Among those guidelines include, and I quote, when we use facts gathered by any other organization, we attribute them. Writers at the Times are their own principal fact checkers and often their only one. We should distinguish a print between personal interviews and telephone or email interviews. In addition, the newspaper uses a dateline only when a reporter has visited the place. Jason Blair knew that rule. A dateline guarantees that the reporter whose name appears on the article 
was at the specific place on the date given and provided the bulk of information. For many photographers assigned to work with Jason Blair on articles, he was often just a voice on the phone. One saying he was on his way or just around the corner at the destination they were set to meet up at. In one article where the photographer never even met Jason, incorporated at least half a dozen passages lifted nearly verbatim from other news sources, including four from the Washington Post. Some of Jason Blair's article provided vivid descriptions of scenes that would often occur in the privacies of people's homes, but the travel records and interviews show that he had not witnessed them. The investigation then looked into Jason's past, how he started at the Times at 21 years old. What they found is truly shocking. Whether as a student journalist at the University of Maryland or as an intern at the Boston Globe, Jason stood out. He seemed to be constantly working, whether on articles or on sources. Some considered him immature, with hungry ambition, and an unsettling interest in newsroom gossip. When asked how he got the internship at the Times, Jason's supervisors and Maryland professors emphasized that he earned an internship at the Times because of his glowing recommendations and a remarkable work history, not because he is black. The Times offered him a slot in the internship program that was then being used at the time but um, bum in large part to help the paper diversify its newsroom. During his 10-week internship at the Times in the summer of 1998, Jason Blair wrote 19 news articles, helped other reporters, and never seemed to leave the newsroom. At the summer's end, the Times offered Jason Blair an extended internship, but he had more college coursework to do before his scheduled graduation in December of 1998. When he returned to the Times newsroom in June 1999, everyone assumed that he had graduated. He had not. College officials said he had one more year of coursework to complete before graduation. Jason Blair was assigned to work in the Times Police Bureau, where he churned out article after article about the crimes of the day, impressing colleagues with his lightning quick writing ability and his willingness to work long hours. In November 1999, the paper promoted Jason Blair to immediate reporter, the next step towards winning a full-time staff position. When reporting on businesses for the Metropolitan Desk, editors say he was energetic and willing to work all hours. He was also a study in carelessness, they say, with his telephone voicemail box being too full to accept any new messages and his writing commitments too numerous. He also would cite sources but not link who said what. Just XYZ said this, so I'm going to use it for my article. The investigation then investigated Jason Blair's travel expenses. Close scrutiny of his travel expenses would have revealed other signs that Jason Blair was not where his editors thought he was. And even more alarming, that he was perhaps concoursing law enforcement sources. But at the time, his expense records were being quickly reviewed by an administrative assistant. Editors did not examine them. On an expense report filed in January, for example, he indicated that he had bought blankets at a Marshalls department store in Washington. The receipt showed that the purchase was made at a Marshalls in Brooklyn. He also reported a purchase at Starbucks in Washington. Again, the receipt showed that the purchase was made in Brooklyn, New York. On both days, he was reportedly writing articles from the Washington, D.C. area. Jason Blair also reported that he dined with a law enforcement officer in a Tolta Pasta restaurant in Washington on the day he wrote the article there. The receipt makes it clear that the Tulsa Pasta was in Brooklyn, New York. Jason Blair said he dined with the same official in Pentagon, another New York City restaurant that placed him in Washington on his expense reports. According to cell phone records, computer logs, and other records described by the New York Times administrators, Jason Blair had at this point developed a pattern of pretending to cover events in the mid-Atlantic region when in fact he was spending most of his time in New York. York City, where he was often at work refining a book proposal about the sniper case. In email messages to colleagues, for example, he conveyed the impression of a travel-weary national correspondent who spent far too much time at LaGuardia Airport terminals. On April 29th, towards the end of Jason Blair's remarkable run of deceit, he was summoned to the newsroom to answer accusations of plagiarism lodged by the San Antonio Express news station. The concern centered on an article that he claimed to have written from Los Fresnos, Texas, but was in fact stolen from the other reporter. In a series of tense meetings over two days, heads of the Times newspaper questioned Jason Blair on his deceit. All of that information I got directly from that article itself. I cut out some stuff, but it's definitely worth the read to learn just exactly what articles he was making up. In the description under sources, there will be a list of every article Jason Blair plagiarized or lied about. As you can guess, he was fired on May 1st, 2003 after his resignation. Jason Blair would never work in journalism again. At the time of the scandal in 2003, the New York Times was the premier newspaper in the country, possibly the world. The scandal on such an important paper had a major impact, not just on the Times, but also on journalism as a whole. The most immediate and obvious impact was the Times created
created the position of the public editor. The position is meant to be an editor whose boss is the public and addresses the concerns of the public in the newsroom. The idea was that if such a position had existed while Jason Blair was engaging in his misdeeds, one of the interviewees he had falsely claimed to have spoken to or someone else from the public could have easily come forward and stopped him sooner. The idea of the public editor proved popular, expanding to newspapers across the U.S. in years to come. Ten years after the scandal in 2013, Jason Blair was remarkably quiet. He had only granted one interview to the media and in it largely declined to talk about his misdeeds. According to that article, he owns a self-life coaching company called Goose Creek Consulting in Virginia and has moved on from journalism entirely. He also wrote a book that no one seemed to have read, including me. On April 11, 2016, Jason Blair spoke to undergraduate Duke students about his scandal. They were all allowed to ask him anything. The first question after a long moment of silence was, why did Jason do it? His answer was calculated and I quote, this is what he said. There's not one real solid reason. It was a perfect storm of events. I really cared about the profession and the impact. I didn't really care about the fame and glory, all of which he contributes to a combination of deep-seated character flaws. At the time, Jason Blair was suffering from undiagnosed bipolar disorder and recovering from a severe drug and alcohol addiction. This then added fuel to the up and down cycle of plagiarizing and fabricating. However, Jason doesn't believe his mental state is an excuse for what he did. He said the following, there are plenty of mentally ill writers out there that don't do similar things. Instead, he emphasized that it was his character that was the core of the problem. Despite the scathing report about his journalistic sins, many people at the times responded with humanity and compassion. The higher ups at the newspaper ultimately put Jason in touch with psychiatrists that helped him treat his bipolar disorder. He claimed, once you do something that crosses an, an ethical line, it is easy to go back and do it over and over again. He said, I danced around it and then crossed it and then had a real hard time coming back. He is sorry for what he did, but not sorry for himself. It made him more humble in Jason's eyes, which strengthened his character. He also is sorry for the colleagues he betrayed, the family he worried, and the damage he caused to journalism's reputation as a whole. In that regard, he said, I feel a lot of sadness. I handed people who didn't want to believe journalism a great case for why they shouldn't trust things. That hits me. Jason Blair now lives in Northern Virginia, close to the family and friends he grew up with. After starting support groups in his area, he began working in mental health and currently runs his own life coaching practice, which I mentioned earlier. Although he wrote a book in 2004 about his experience called Burning Down My Master's House, he says he regrets writing it so soon after the scandal. It took him, he estimates, eight years to truly gain perspective on what happened. Lastly, Jason Blair wasn't seeking to return to journalism, he said, because he understands why he'd never be hired. And I quote, once you've done something that leads people to question your trust, your effectiveness in the field becomes limited. You don't have the right to go back. I still love journalism. I miss it, but it just doesn't work without trust. That is all the information I have on this case. Let me know your thoughts and opinions down below. I thought this case was really interesting because obviously it was 20 years ago, so a lot has changed since then. I mean, the internet is extremely more prevalent now, and something like this, the plagiarism, the misinformation, just making up lies, really relates to, in my opinion, the misinformation on TikTok or on social media as a whole. People can just say whatever they want and get away with it, and people will run with it as the truth. So we could learn from something like this when applying it to those platforms now. I think it can be very dangerous on, well, on the internet in general, when anyone can say whatever and it can go viral and hundreds of thousands of people can believe it. Let me know your thoughts on this and everything I said. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. As always, the palette cleanser, the doggo picture of the day is this picture of, this picture of Scarlett drinking her pup cup at Dutch Bros. All right, that's all I have for today. Love you, mean it, kisses. Don't do anything stupid and I'll see y'all next time. Bye.